Hey there, everybody. Hello and welcome to Relaxed Mail. I am Brian and end of the year is upon us and it's time for Christmas. Uh, we just had the wonderful holidays come about and now it is time to start talking about um, about Christmas, the holidays and all that fun stuff. Uh, but wanted to make uh, mix things up just a little bit instead of talking about um, uh, talking about things that we're, we're always, I'm always going on about, I wanted to venture off of the, uh, off the highway just a little bit and talk about some Christmas traditions. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about uh, 14 different types of Christmas traditions you can start in your family right now. Hello and welcome. Alrighty. So we are talking Christmas traditions and 14 different types of traditions that you could actually have in your uh, in your family, incorporate them this year in your family, and people will enjoy them. Uh, and the reasons why I wanted to start off with why are traditions so popular? Well, first off, it gives everybody a sense of of similarity, uh, a sense of uh, of of being, you know that you're home when you walk walk in and you smell grandma's apple pie. You smell the the the, the pecan pies, bacon. Uh, you get to try. You get to have uh, you know Uncle Ralph's uh, world famous dressing. Um, there's a lot of uh, of memories that draw us back and bring us into a common area. And these traditions do that. Um, some traditions are meant to help people. Um, remember why we get together for the uh, for the holidays um or and then there's others that just allow for us to understand that christmas is a time of fun it's time of just getting together and 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 enjoying each other's uh company and having some good laughs and a good time and to create memories also so wanted to do a little piece and I wrote out a blog post on this and I thought, you know what, this would make a great little video too. So what are some traditions that you could actually do for your family, with your family and, um, and incorporate everybody. You can, uh, we've got, uh, some that are more adult oriented, some that are more children oriented and some that are more community oriented. So just, it covers a whole little bit of everything and, uh, and, uh, and anything and everything. So starting off with um, is the first tradition I would actually suggest you try doing is reading Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Um, you're going, holy smokes, read a whole, a whole book? Well, Charles Dickens' uh, A Christmas Carol isn't that long. It takes about an hour and a half to, to two hours reading, depending on how much production time you want to put into it. Uh, and this is a fun way for you or whoever is the reader to, to incorporate some of their own um, personality into the story. Uh, you, could, you're, you can come up with the different types of voices for, say, uh, you want Bob Marley to sound very ghostly and things like that, and you, or you may have Scrooge sound, have, a, have a Scottish accent or something. Whatever your choice is, on the matter is is completely up to you. You can put as much life and production into the story that you want to actually put, uh, and it becomes a memorable feat uh, as you stand up and you all right. We're uh, doing the annual reading of uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and you may want to give a little backstory on it, and because Charles Dickens actually that's what he used to do he would uh, every Christmas he would take his story and go out and he would read it to the masses he would read he would actually take his story and read that to everybody and so that is um, one of the reasons why I was thinking this would be a great uh, tradition to add because it doesn't take that long it's an hour and a half Monopoly games last far longer than reading a Christmas story Carol so you might try that out. See what you, how it works. Uh, you might. I would do a couple of dry runs first. You know, just you standing in front of the mirror, 
for an hour and a half reading the story just so that you can get uh, the cadence and things like that that you want down, uh, down pat and solid. Another Christmas tradition that you might actually like is along the same lines as reading Christmas Carol, and that is reading Towards the Night Before Christmas. Uh, this is the quintessential uh, poem that started, a lot of people attribute to modern day Christmas. This is where Santa, you know, they started putting Santa coming down the chimney and, and, and uh, the reindeer and all this on all these other items accumulated and became what we know now know as the modern day Santa Claus. But the story itself, uh, the poem is a fun one. And again, you're able to add some, your own personality into this story and you may do your own productions. You may have, uh, incorporate the kids and let them, you know, have fun doing whatever, uh, whatever it is adding to the, uh, you know, have the son in a, uh, uh, and a nightcap and ma and a kerchief and and all this uh, and all the other fun things that uh, go about on acting out this um, this poem. So you can get involved and let the kids uh, have fun with this. Now the uh, one thing about this though is if you start reading this and one year you forget, it's going to be time for you to send the kids to bed and they're going to all chime in and go, but we haven't read the uh, night before Christmas. And when they do that, then you know you have a winter tradition on your tan and you definitely want to keep going with it. Another Christmas tradition that you might, uh, that is more adult oriented, but is still a lot of fun is, um, is where we get the original idea of Christmas carols. And this is actually back in the medieval times, back when the Lord, there were lords and ladies that, uh, that were dotted all over the, uh, all over the town and, and the, uh, and the, and the different proverbs and things of, of, of England, people would actually get together during Christmas time and go from house to house singing and being married and getting raucously drunk at the same time. And this was called wassailing. Uh, you've heard the song, here we go, a wassailing, and da 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 da. Um, that whole festive environment was people would get together. Usually some guy would be carrying a giant punch bowl, or at least I picture it. They just say it's a wassail bowl. And uh, it's what they use to carry their punch in. And so I'm picturing the old, st the current day uh, punch bowl. So this guy's walking around, you know, he's toasted anyhow, but uh, stumbling around. You got, uh, you got, uh, you know, maybe trash can punch or something like that. You know, some type of horrid alcoholic concoction sloshing around. And, you know, all you have to do is just whiff the fumes and you're Ill and it's illegal for you to drive, but it's, everybody is having this good time. Now, the reason you don't hear about wassailing so much anymore is because along the line, uh, you hear also of an, from another song, um, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh, there is, um, so bring out some figgy pudding. Uh, you got that line? So bring us some figgy pudding. So bring us some figgy pudding. So bring us some figgy pudding and bring it right here. And then the next line was, or, and we won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some. So bring it out now or bring it right here. However it goes. Anyhow, that whole line is part of what wassailing was. They would go around, they would sing. And if a lord or lady was didn't respond to their singing, they got louder and they got rowdier. And there would be times where these roving drunken bands of people would go back around and would destroy property. Actually, they would sit there and tear stuff up until the Lord and lady came out with their figgy pudding and went here, here, leave us alone. And then they would, you know, stumble off to the next house. Now I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not saying go off, get raucously drunk, public intoxication, these days is highly frowned upon in, here in the U.S., so don't do that. But, you know, you can actually have a good time and go Christmas caroling. And you could actually even bring the kids involved with Christmas caroling. You can all just stay nice and warm and have hot cocoa and, you know, sing Silent Night. There are forms of this that people do, churches do uh, nowadays. So it's a lot more tame 
But at the same time, I think it'd be kind of fun just to walk around with this big old punch bowl and, you know, you know your wassail cup and just have a good, a good time, stay civil, but at the same time, you know, maybe you can do some wassailing and if you're in an enclosed, you know, uh, gated community or something, you might do that or then again, you may not be allowed to. Anyhow, <laughs> tradition. Another tradition is actually where we get uh, the mistletoe, hanging mistletoe above the above the door, uh, and that is called a a kissing bow. And now take your um, take a, a little sprig of mistletoe. Now take a large branch of mistletoe, which is just a parasitic uh, uh, branch off of a tree, and take a whole bunch of those. Weave it all together until you have a beach ball size of, of, of mistletoe. And then what you do is you take that and you hang it from the bow of your house. And so you have this kissing bow. It's uh, this large ball, uh, ball of, uh, of mistletoe. And it was where you convened and had a, uh, a lot of times it would be, you know, hanging over um, the entranceway. And that's where the, the kissing part come from is they would actually, you kissed under the bow. Now, from, I've read a couple places where some people said that everybody kissed and there's times where they, you know, it was just particular people kissed. So depending on how, which, uh, which rendition you, you came across, it uh, depends on how many people your lips would be smacking against. Now, another tradition that from the Middle Ages, um, is also a lot of fun, but you want to make sure you've got some friends who are kind of uh, okay with uh, this type of fun. And that is actually called the tradition of cake tossing. Now, what you would do is you would take a cake. Oh, it's a cake. <gasps> it's a cake. You would take a cake and um, beautifully decorated and all that, and you would take it to a friend's house, and instead of going knock, 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 hey, here you go, here's a cake, you would actually take the cake and you would throw it at their front door. Thwop! You know, and it would make a noise and come down and it, you'd destroy a perfectly well made cake. But what that does, or what it was believed to do in the Middle Ages, was that it um, was a, um, it was a means of blessing a person's house for, uh, for prosperity. So, an abundance. And so you would take a cake and you would bless someone by throwing a cake at their front door. That's why I'm saying you might want to make sure you have a friend who's okay with that because out of nowhere, all of a sudden, they got a random FUD on their door and they go to answer and they see this destroyed cake. They may not be too happy. So again, after you throw the cake and you're, and you're, uh, uh, and you laugh about it for a moment, um, you know, you want to help them clean it up and wipe off the, the icing from, you might just use white icing if they've got a white door. So make sure the door, their icing matches their door. So in case there's a stain, <laughs> or you might be painting a door. So, but anyhow, there's that uh, fun tradition of just cake tossing as, as another one. The next one that I want to talk about is actually more of a, the next one I want to talk about is actually more of, of a means of being able to help people. The tradition of a Christmas jar. Now, what it is, a Christmas jar, take your ordinary, uh, not Vlasic, but a uh, uh, best made pickle jar. You know, they're kind of short, squat, kind of round, fairly well rounded in the middle. They're just kind of a, it, they look like a pickle barrel. It's meant to look like a pickle barrel. They're just kind of short, about yay tall, about yay big around. And that best made uh, is better, probably the better one. They're these glass, they, but they're these little jars. Take all the uh, all the labels off of it, clean it up nice, and then through the year of um, take your change and you put your change in the pickle jar. Take your uh, take some dollar bills. You may throw a twenty or a ten or some fives in there, and just fill this thing up solid with your change and and, and money. Now the magic of this comes into play once the jar is full. Uh, you take it. You can decorate the lid if you want to. Uh, put the lid on tight, and then you and the kids, everybody gets together and decides who's going to get this jar. Now this jar is meant for someone who is 
in need. Say you, uh, someone, uh, one of the kids' classmates' uh, dad was killed in a car wreck or something, you know. So something horrible where they're, they've hit a hard time. Maybe mom's now struggling just with doing three jobs, just trying to keep the lights on. And Lord knows that there's not any way that she's going to be able to be, to, uh, to get any Christmas presents for, uh, for one of the kids. That's where this uh, can become a blessing. And it helps, uh, helps kids out in understanding what is uh, the, the, the glories of, of, of being charitable. Because some people look at charity as going, yeah, I gave uh, some money to so-and-so. And they are very boastful about what they've done. They've given out, you know, oh, I've given $30,000, you know, whatever. Well, that's a lot of money to give away. But um, If they did, great, good for them. But anyhow, they boast about how much money they've given to charity. Well, the the glory and the and the... The magic with this is that when you give it to a person and you decide who, who you're giving it to, you just go up to their porch, you set it by the front door, and you leave. You don't, next day, go up to them and go, hey, how'd you like that pickle jar yeah, or that Christmas jar? You don't, don't mention it to them at all. Let them wonder where it come from. Let them understand that there are people out there who know that they're struggling but allows them to save face by not having to be confronted with the fact of, yeah, we all know you're having a hard time. At least now they can go off and they can, with their head still held high, somewhat high, be able to buy some of the much needed items that they are, are lacking. And they can do that without having to worry about some type of, of shame and sadly, they, a lot of people view receiving uh, charity as a shame. Um, as long as it's charity and not just a handout. But a, uh, a Christmas jar allows for that. And allows the kids to have a hand at helping somebody. So they understand the value of giving away. Uh, um, of giving away. Uh, or helping a person also. This next tradition is, there's some debate as to where it started. Some people say it's a German thing. I personally have always heard it as being a Southern thing. And that is, there is a special ornament on a lot of people's trees that you're not supposed to, if you find, you, it's a good thing. But it makes, it, people when they first see it, a lot of times causes a lot of questions. It is a glass pickle. This is the Christmas pickle. Now, there's not any magical story behind uh, the glass pickle that, or the, the Christmas pickle that I personally know of. What I really know, what I really, all I really know about uh, the uh, Christmas pickle is that uh, at one time it was in vogue to take a, uh, to decorate your tree in fruits and vegetables, in glass fruits and vegetables. So you had, Tiffany would probably had like some bananas and oranges and apples and pears and uh, asparagus and, and cucumbers and, and, and okra and you know, all these other fruits and vegetables. Um, and they, people would apparently would decorate their tree in these fruits and vegetables. And yeah, I make it sound like it's really weird, but at the same time, I have R2-D2, some Star War, other Star Wars items, a manta ray, and uh, some Harry Potter ornaments on my Christmas tree. So I guess in hindsight, it's not near as weird as I would think it is. But the other ornaments pretty much have grown, fallen out of favor, except for the, the Christmas pickle. What happens with the Christmas pickle these days is uh, it is the last ornament that is hung up. But you don't hang it up. The person who hangs it up doesn't hang it up until everybody else is is no longer paying attention. So it might be dad late at night after the tree was put up the uh, day after Thanksgiving. Um, after the kid's gone to bed and the wife's gone to bed, he'll make, he takes the Christmas pickle and he hides it somewhere on the tree. Where? Doesn't matter. Just hides it somewhere. And it doesn't tell anybody that he's hidden it. 
But as the kids go through, they someone may as they stumble across it, when they find it, they get an extra, they get an extra present. Usually it's like a $20 bill or something. Well, it used to be smaller, but we're talking inflation now. So they would get, you know, the kid usually gets, uh, gets money if they can find that uh, Christmas pickle before the 25th. So just a little something fun. Keeps the kids paying attention to the Christmas tree. The next Christmas tradition is one that is can be a lot of fun because it involves creativity. You have to find a way of being creative with this. Instead of having just your normal old two uh, mom from the kids, now you're doing to the lady who gave us birth, we, uh, we hand this present to you with lots of mirth, you know, something along those lines. Um, it helps it, you present a Christmas poem for the present. You give your presents with a Christmas poem. So it takes a bit of, of uh, creativity and to write out a short little poem on a, on a piece of paper and you attach it to the present. And so they have, you read the present uh, or the person who receives it reads the present out loud and you can actually start having some fun with this. You can make it to where um, it's a riddle. Who, did, who gave you the present and who's it actually to or, and things like that. So um, you can make this a, kind of a game and make it enjoyable. And if you do that, then all right, it makes, uh, makes your, uh, your Christmas uh, morning a little bit more um, entertaining. And, uh, and enjoyable if you're able to incorporate maybe a, a Christmas poem or a present poem from time to time. Now, another one ties back into uh, the Victorian era, around the same time that Dickens wrote uh, A Christmas Carol. And this is the uh, tradition of sitting by the fireplace and telling scary ghost stories like in the like mentioned in the most wonderful time of the year and that's where i got to, found out about this tradition is because i kept hearing most wonderful you know the talk about the uh uh what is it chestnuts for roasting and uh marshmallows for toasting and da 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 da, da. there'll be uh plenty of glory uh or uh da, 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 da. uh but anyhow uh Scary ghost stories of Christmases long, long ago. Well, what are these ghost stories they're talking about? Why are they telling ghost stories? Well, for most of the time, I thought it was just they were, it was a reference to um, a Christmas Carol. But in a, uh, come to find out, that's something they used to do for Christmas is they would sit around the fireplace and tell ghost stories a lot. I guess that's probably where the tradition of sitting around a campfire and telling ghost stories came about. But uh, however. It's just it's something neat. If you want, if you got kids who people you don't mind scaring a little bit, you know, a little bit older kids, uh, this would be a fun way to being able to uh, to share some of your favorite ghost stories with them. So that's uh, something you can actually do is actually tell scary ghost stories during Christmas Eve. Something that's fun that you can actually have the kids involved, or you can make it more adult oriented, is uh, the white elephant gift uh, party. Now, there's a there's a whole set of rules for this. Um, you can actually take the rules and bend them to any way you want. But if you want a, a uh, official list of what the Christmas uh, white elephant gift uh, rules are, I've got a uh, uh, link down in this. Uh, there's actually a white elephant gift website. Um, party website and so it's just it's down there it's in the it's in the description below but um, this could be a lot of fun um, because it's just it there's a touch of chaos involved and it makes the world uh, makes the the game just a little more interesting um, now it becomes even more fun when you actually take the uh, the white elephant gift party and you add a theme to it. So it might be an alcohol based uh, party or it might be, you know, a more adult oriented party or it might be uh, more of a kids. You may be where everybody has a different toy that they bring um, and trade it out. And so by the time you're done, everyone's got, you know, maybe some type of action figure or something Star Wars oriented or Star Trek or, or Conan the Barbarian, whatever theme you want to have, dude, you can have this, uh, have this, uh, make a theme of it for, uh, as a rule for your, your white elephant gift party. So that if you're wanting, if you're having an office party and you're wanting to know something fun to do, 
this could be something fun for you to do. So check, give it a try. Just check it out. And it may be uh, may end up being something where everybody starts looking forward to it. Um, something else that you can do with the kids, and the kids will enjoy this, is uh, make the nearly, and I'm going to preface that with a nearly indestructible uh, Christmas ornament. The salt dough ornaments. Uh, kids like to make these, you know, it's the stuff that you made. Uh, you take it and you roll it out and you use the cookie cutter and you make the different shapes. And then you take it and you bake them uh, for a certain amount of time. And when they come out, they're rock hard, you know. And so you can then take these, uh, take the dough and then you can paint it and decorate it however you want. And uh, put a little hole in the top uh, before you bake it. And then it hangs around on the Christmas tree for ever almost uh we did about uh we've done i don't know i think we did about 10 15 for the uh 10 or 15 for i think it's 15 because there were three kids involved but uh we're down to about seven so and that has lasted us since the oldest was about four so that's four five six seven eight nine um yeah it's been well over uh well over uh 18, it's been 15, well, the youngest one, she was barely there, so she really didn't make any, but uh, she barely made some. So it was, I don't know. Anyhow, I'm getting lost in, in nostalgia, but anyhow, these things last forever is what I'm getting at. So, and they have fun making them. And so you can do this once or twice, or you can make a whole tree out of, uh, out of Christmas dough, uh, how, and the salt dough. So whatever, however it is you want. Um, but yeah, once they are made, let the kids hang them up on the tree because that's part of it. They helped contribute to the beauty of their tree and they're, they're proud of their, their creations. So let them make the creations and hang it up on the tree. Now, the last two are also more community-based. Um, these are for the people who really have no means of being able to help themselves. The first one is um, spend a day at a nursing home. Take the kids with you, uh, especially those who are reading, uh, able to read. Uh, still young, first, second, third, third grade. You might go with them and sit with them and let them read the newspaper to uh, uh, to someone who doesn't have anybody to uh, who comes and visits. And you can always ask the uh, nurses station there and go, hey. Um, who do you have who ha uh, here who doesn't have anybody who visit them or who's because who's, uh, there there's always sadly more than one person in a uh, in a nursing home who doesn't have family members to come uh, drop them off. Usually there might be even someone whose kids brought them to the uh, nursing home, dropped them off skedaddled out of the out of the area and has never come back to see him again and he's been there for five years and no one has stopped to visit him these are the people that you want to see and that so there's some magical stuff that happens when you start if you start doing this on a regular basis say every wednesday at uh, at six you go and you spend two hours with uh with people um you go and they start uh you may go first go to uh start talking to him and he's the the guy might be just barely in his seat uh in his uh in his bed and he's just laying there and he's just under the blanket and not being very animated at all but if you keep coming back time and time again talking to him asking how his day's going reading the newspaper to him giving him you know interaction communication human contact is what it's actually all about you all of a sudden start seeing that when you show up at six o'clock at night or on that every every Wednesday, when you pull in and walk into his room, instead of him being all curled up underneath the blankets, you might see him sitting up in bed waiting for you to show up. And you bring and nurture and needle that 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 human emotion and human contact out of them. And you start learning some stuff about some of these people and they have some of the most extraordinary tales of their life. And so you try it out. Try, you might do, be something you start doing is once a, once a week or once every other week. 
start going over to uh, to the nursing home and sit down and just talk to somebody, share, uh, share, share some time with them, sit down and eat with them. Yes, I know it is cafeteria food. It's probably the worst food you ever taste, but sit down and have a meal with them. That's all they want. They want human contact. They want to have someone show that they care about them and that they matter to the world again. And you will be able to do that. So try this out. Now for the last uh, tradition, it is the, the classic. Uh, that classic tradition is go to a soup kitchen. Serve those who are that far down on their luck. They can't, don't even have enough money to get food for themselves. This allows for you and the kids to be able to first gain some gratitude for the things you do have. Because you might see a child in, the, in, in this group who is carrying around a, just the head of a doll. And it, a lot of times it moves your children to do some amazing charitable items. And don't hold them back. If they want to be charitable and they want to give all their toys away to, to this nursing, to this, uh, to, to the uh, woman's shelter, why not let them? I mean, it's, you're providing, they're wanting to help. And a lot of times kids will do some of the most amazing things if they're given the opportunity to help. And they, all they have to do is be shown there's somebody out who's not quite as good, well off as you. And when you do that, they're, they're ready to go. So you might be able to pull your children out of a, uh, out of the, uh, out of a weird uh, frame of mind where it's all about them and start seeing that it's, hey, it's about other people. Now, speaking of kids, last one is probably the scariest one for us adults. <laughs> and it is, let them make it, plan a party. You may have a child who you never knew, who doesn't like to do anything until all of a sudden he gets to plan a party. And all of a sudden she gets to lay out what, to, what meals she wants to have, what types of drinks she wants to have, and what themes they want to have. All of a sudden, you allow all this creativity to start flowing from these kids, and you might be surprised. Yeah, the cleanup afterwards is going to be kind of a pain in the butt, and it might be a lot more in-depth and a lot more involved than what uh, they realize. But at the same time, that's okay. If they want to they want to try doing something um, a little wild and hairy, go for the ride. You might be amazed at what turns out. So anyhow, there you go. You have 14 different types of... of uh, of traditions that you can uh, you can t do with your family this year and uh, so give it a try and see what happens you might be surprised that uh, all of a sudden you have a little bit more meaning in your holiday season so if you like this video please click the subscribe also give me a like uh, give me a big old thumbs up I could really use those helps for uh, helps YouTube to Point me out to other people who might be looking for just this very video. So you take care. Have a great blessed holidays. And we will talk to you next time. Till then, bye.